you. Is that me? Okay, so um, thank you all for making it to the crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing skepticism workshop. It's good to see so many people here because I do think that this workshop's covering some of the most important stuff in skepticism. And specifically, I mean skeptic activism. I think um, activism is one of the most important things we do in the skeptical movement because we can all be skeptical at home. You don't need anyone else to do that. To be part of the movement, it's about doing something, making a difference. And skeptical activism is just there to help other people be skeptical too, to help other people not make bad decisions, um, and to help other people avoid misinformation and deception. So I think this activism is incredibly important because when people in our society act on bad information, we all pay a price. So for example, um, when people believe that vaccination causes autism, then we end up getting outbreaks of preventable diseases. Uh, when people believe that delaying recommended treatments for nine months for alternative treatments um, can cost them their lives, and that costs all of us something. Uh, or when researchers, for example, you know, genuine scientific researchers spend their time trying to find, find out whether homeopathy works for the thousandth time, ignoring the other thousandth of, thousands of um, papers and studies that have been done on the subject that have shown no discernible difference from placebo or, um, and based on no scientific basis whatsoever, then they are real researchers that are spending their research hours that could be spent finding real medicines and real drugs. You know, there's so much work to be done in medicine and when people believe things which aren't true, they waste their time and waste the potential of society. So, Um, that went twice, didn't it? Um, I just want to make the point that while I just gave the examples that I think everyone in this room agrees with, the other side, you know, other people would say other things. Other people would think that vaccines cause harm, and if you believe that vaccines are safe, then you'll get harmed. Um, that big pharma is the problem, and you put your trust in them, then that will harm you. And I put these slides up just to make the point that at the end of the day, what the point that I'm trying to make is that false beliefs cause the harm. Our goal is not to try and push one conclusion or the other. Our goal is to find out what is reality, what is the truth. So we need to have processes to get us there. And so trying to close that gap between the beliefs that we have and the beliefs that everyone in society has and get them as close to reality as possible is the ultimate goal. Because when you believe something, let's say if you believe that a particular share price is going to go up tomorrow and you believe it enough that you put your money in it, if your belief is wrong, it will cost you money. If you believe you can take a corner at 80 miles per hour, but you can't, that could cost you your life. When your belief is out of line with reality, that costs you something and costs society something. So for me, my skepticism is simply a war on false beliefs. I believe it's our duty to try and destroy all beliefs that are wrong. Because that pushes, that helps us progress in society. If we can kill all these false beliefs, we stop wasting time, we stop wasting people's health, we stop wasting people's lives, and we can work on what matters. So I, um, so I say let us end false beliefs. That's the first point that I wanted to make in this um, workshop, um, that fighting false beliefs is what it's all about, trying to destroy them. The second point that I want to quickly make in this little introductory talk that I'm giving that didn't lead into very well, is that the internet has changed everything. In the war on false beliefs, the internet is not yet the number one source of information, but it will be. You can be pretty sure of that. It's growing rapidly. Um, world population, 2005, what have we got? Uh, using the internet, we've gone from 16% to 39% over the last seven years, and it's just gonna keep growing. So not only is the number of people using the internet growing, the number of content on the internet is growing, the amount of time we spend on the internet, the accessibility we have at the internet is growing. It's Google Glass, so we can wear the internet everywhere we go. This is a contact lens with a computer in it. Not yet reality, but reasonably likely that this is where computer internet technology is going. We're going to be permanently on the internet, permanently accessing all of this information, basically for the rest of human civilization. We're going to get more and more immersed into the internet. So the internet has changed everything. Um, 
Because, bringing it back to the false belief thing, if we are all permanently immersed in this information source, and, and the, the percentage of the world population is coming more and more that have this access, um, you're all probably aware that there's no editorial oversight on what goes on the internet. There's no screening process, there's no quality control. It is just um, a free range of information. And that's part of what makes it great. Because that has led to the world's largest ever gladiatorial arena of memes to fight it out amongst themselves, vying for belief in the human mind. So yeah, this is what comes up when you search Google for memetic gladiatorial arena. <laughs> um, it's just a silly pic. But, um, so what is so amazing about the internet is that it is a level playing field. All ideas have to float or sink on their own merits. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem like truth is the most important criteria in determining what becomes popular, popular and what doesn't. So here are a few examples of beliefs which demonstrate this point pr pretty clearly, I think. Um, if truth was the number one criteria of whether be people believe things or not, then I don't think these would be common beliefs. It would be beliefs at all. Um, I checked the Flat Earth Society does exist, and they are serious. <laughs> um, and with dowsing, I've actually seen a documentary once of a guy building a house somewhere, and he actually hired a dowser to come and find and tell him where to dig his well. So people actually do use this stuff and believe it's real. Um, but again, I just want to make the point that maybe I'm wrong. Maybe all or some of these are actually true. I don't want to talk about, you know, to pick on certain beliefs. I'm trying to make the point that when our beliefs are out of line with reality, it costs us money and time. So I put this graph up of the site's major religious groups, the world's major religion groups. Not all of them can be right. Only one of them, at most, can be true. They're all contradictory in one way or another. So best case scenario, Christianity is correct, and 68.5% of the population are holding at least one false belief. I think, of course, it's far more than that that are holding false beliefs, but just to put no doubt in your mind that we all harbour false beliefs. Every single one of us. And I see our challenge in the sceptical movement as reducing that to as close to zero as humanly possible. Of course, there's limits on that. But yeah, trying to destroy false beliefs and we have this internet. Um, oh, no, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. So we have this, um, sorry, I'm ahead of that. So the internet's allowing people to go on and delve into these beliefs and reinforce them and um, get more evidence for them and so forth. And there's no editorial oversight providing them with a way of discerning whether these beliefs are, are good or not. And so maybe, you know, when people are making these decisions about what to believe, maybe they are using other criteria like simplicity or, um, ob you know, direct observations being intuitive, like the Flat Earth Society. There's different criteria than truth determining whether they believe something or not. Maybe it's the comfort or how entertaining the belief is. So now we have this internet where everyone's going to get this information and this wild west of information is just letting people wander in and pick and choose for themselves without any system of education or how to assess the information responsibility. And I don't think this is, this is not good. Um, so can you imagine what it's going to be like when in 20 or 30 years we have an entire population of the planet plugged into the internet permanently and they can just get whatever information they want without any critical reflection on what it means or whether it's reliable or whether it's true. And we're just going to keep reinforcing false beliefs over and over and over again and, and creating groups of people believing different things and then working with their own groups. So I don't think we can let that happen. I think this is our, our job as the skeptics to make sure that there is a system in place which is going to inform the entire planet for the next 50 or 100 years, perhaps the rest of human civilization, if the internet sticks around for that long. Um, we need to make sure it isn't going to keep us as misinformed as we are today. We need some sort of a mimetic immune system for the internet. And is, I didn't define mimetics before, or memes. Um, these days, memes often mean to a lot of people just um, little cartoons on the internet. But for those that don't know, Richard Dawkins wasn't actually the first, according to Rebutter. Um, 
we had someone do that. Um, the Richard Dawkins popularized the term meme as sort of the, idea, the currency of ideas, the smallest unit of an idea which spreads from one person to another. So it copies itself from one brain to another brain. And so the internet is a way of storing ideas and spreading them very widely. So we need an, an immune system to stop bad ideas, bad information, misinformation, lies. We need to stop it in its track, um, either destroying it or just stopping it from spreading, like a virus. We need to, if it's bad, it needs to be killed. Actually, we're probably going to need a couple of defense systems. <laughs> just like that one. Um, but here's the really cool bit, is that they're being developed and experimented on right now. You see, I think everyone has this illusion that the internet is finished somehow. But we are so at the beginning of the internet. We are developing the technology. We are developing the websites, the ideas, the culture of the internet right now. It is still a baby, and we are influencing its future. So um, I think the internet that you see today is going to look just as tacky and outdated and ridiculous in 10 years from now as the internet of 20 years ago looks to us today. That's IMDB in the top left. I think that's the best example of this. So as the internet grows from today and changes and evolves, we have this brief window of opportunity to leave an impact on it. We can do our best to make sure the future has these systems in place which don't let people expose themselves to deceitful misinformation without some sort of a cautionary response, some sort of a mimetic immune system. Um, so yeah, we can do that, leave a permanent mark on it. Uh, a little bit of skeptical activism in the right internet-based tool or project can impact potentially millions or even billions of people over the next 5, 20 or 100 years. So that's all I really wanted to say in my little intro section here. Just that false beliefs cause people to make poor decisions which harms them and everyone associated with them. Um, the internet is going to be the main source of information from now on, basically, um, getting more and more significant and ubiquitous all the time. And luckily, we are at the dawn of the internet, and we have the power to create the immune systems. And this is you know, a little diagram of human immune system. And you can see there's lots of different things that work for us. And the internet's going to be the same. We're going to have lots of different apps, different programs, different avenues to control the spread of misinformation. And we need to develop them and work on them and make them a reality. Um, to help prevent, to help save our future generations from their believing brains. Brains that evolution have given us that aren't ready for this level of um, misinformation dissemination. So, with those two ideas planted firmly in your minds, um, we're going to move on to the first section of our workshop, which will be me talking about a project I've been working on called Rebutter. After that, uh, Tim will give us uh, 10 or 15 minutes of overview of other apps that have come out recently, which are pretty cool to help with this process. And then after that, Susan will talk about, Susan's up the back, will be talking about guerrilla skepticism on, the, on Wikipedia and her other project at Skeptic Action. So um, that's the overview for it. Now, while we're talking, did we, with the, anyone has, if, if anyone has any questions during the talk, if you just put your hand up or make, make eye contact with the people wearing the green shirts. They've got bits of cardboard, uh, cardboard and pens. You can write your questions down, and then at the end we'll have a bit of time to um, answer a few of them. So, that's that. Now, on to rebutter. So, this is a project that I've been working on for about a year and a half now. And, it, obviously, I keep mentioning mimetic immune system. This is basically my attempt to make one of those. Um, so I'm just going to explain what Rebutter is and how it works, and then I'll show you why I believe we can actually destroy misinformation with this tool, and then show some examples of it already in action. So it all started about two years ago when a friend shared this article on uh, Facebook. I, I had a quick look at the article, and I read the study behind it. So it actually had a linked to a study, which was pretty good for this sort of thing. And um, I went and had a look at it, but I could see straight away all the flaws with the study. I could see what was wrong with it and why this whole article was just nonsense and rubbish and should have been, it shouldn't exist, it should be ignored. But I was stuck with this problem where a friend had just shared this article. 
I mean, they thought it was good, reliable, valuable information which all their friends should know about. So I needed a way to sort of to help them realize that it's not good information. I couldn't just say this is crap because they wouldn't, they wouldn't listen to that. I, what I needed was a detailed, thorough rebuttal showing them exactly what's wrong with it. So it's, I could have written one myself because I, could, you know, I knew what was wrong with it. I could have written it, but it would have taken me an hour or two because I'm a slow writer. And I also was very, very confident that someone else had already done it. I know the internet. People do this all the time. Someone had rebutted this article. I just needed to find it. So if you want to find things on the internet, I went to Google. And unfortunately, Google is no good at finding rebuttals of specific articles. Google's a topic search engine. You put in the heading of that article, you just get hundreds of copies of that article. It's the same article over and over again on different pages because it was done as a press release. Um, and besides, Google doesn't know the intention of the author. They don't know what a rebuttal is, so they've got no way of finding it. So Google was no help at all. And then the article itself, that's, they're not about to tell me where rebuttals of it is. They're not going to help me out in this process. So I had no way of finding you know, a counter-argument to this page. And so the idea behind rebuttal was just this frustration. I wanted, like Google, you type in a search term, it gives you a list of pages, with the one at the top probably being the most relevant, the best page for what you're looking for. I wanted a list of pages that are rebuttals to this page, with the top of the list being the best. So that's what we ended up going out and building. Page on the left has been rebutted by the pages on the right. So on the right, you've got a list of all the rebuttals of that page. Um, keep moving this along. The, um, so if you write or find a rebuttal, you can connect it to the page that it rebuts, or anyone else can. And then anyone who wants to find rebuttals of this rebutted page can do so. Um, at the moment, the primary delivery method is this browser extension little rebuttal logo, you install it into your browser, and then as you browse the internet, whenever you hit a rebutted page, it pops up a little alert and says there are three rebuttals to this page. You click on the plugin again and it gives you that list. Thank you. And it gives you that list of the rebuttals. That's our main um, system of delivering rebuttals. But also we've put just a simple Google search on the website. So now you can search our website for the page you want rebuttals of and if we have rebuttals of that page, it'll come up in the search results. So Google can't do this on their own because they don't have this mapping of the semantic connection. This is a rebuttal. But because we've created this map, now you can search for them. Um, we've also developed a Twitter widget which allows you to tweet the rebuttal articles as replies to people that are sharing the rebutted pages. So you can take the message of the rebuttals straight to the people that are spreading the misinformation. Uh, and finally, we're about to start work on a frame model. I've just mocked this up. So a frame will work within the browser, so you don't need to install a plugin. But that's coming in the future. Um, so oh, that's right. So I just put this slide up just to, to reiterate the simplicity of what we're doing. Rebutter is a one-to-one -one connection. That page is rebutted by that page. But we don't, it's not exclusive. It's not like they can only be rebutted by that page and that page can only rebut that. This page is rebutted by 24 different pages. So 24 people have written articles saying that that's wrong for whatever reason. That page is then also rebutted by two different pages. So this page is rebutted by that page, that page is rebutted by other pages. So we actually form a bit of a discussion across the internet. We map the discussion. This page rebuts zero. That page rebuts 15. So we actually, through this simple concept of connecting one page to another, we end up getting a network, a map of rebuttals and rebuttings. So, but at its basis, it's just a one-to-one -one connection. It's very simple. But don't let that simplicity deceive you, because I think like stacking bricks is an incredibly simple process. But you don't just stack bricks for the fun of it. You stack bricks because you have a vision. You want to build a house. You want to build a mansion. Something. There's a goal, a purpose of the action. And so adding these one-to-one -one links has a purpose. And I want to talk to you now about our vision and our purpose behind Rebutter. And so to get started with that, I want to um, share something with you that I learned recently. Um, now, 
I'm sure most people know that public speaking is one of like the, the top 10 fears, usually one or two on the list. Luckily, I don't have a debilitating version of that fear, but still I get nervous when I have to give public talks. But I learned something just recently um, which helps with that. Now, I think also most people know about body language and how like, if you have closed arms, it sort of implies you're afraid or a little bit you know, scared or yeah, you close, you don't want to talk to people. Where the opposite, if you sort of, you know, gregarious people are large and move around and whatever. Well, I learned just recently that the opposite works as well. Where instead of letting your emotions control your body language, you can manipulate your body language and create emotions. So the research indicates that whenever you're going to do something like public speaking or you go to an interview or something which creates a bit of nervousness, if you spend two minutes in a position like this, the Wonder Woman pose, <laughs> You just sort of spend two minutes in this position or, or that position, some sort of big open position, it actually changes your brain and releases, you know, testosterone, I think it was, was, was one of the chemicals, and just various things that make you feel more confident, make you feel stronger, more capable. Um, so I learned that recently, I thought that was very cool. Um, now, just want to get a show of hands, who here has not heard of this before? If, if, be brave, put your hands up. You haven't heard of this? Okay, now keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Um, everyone who thinks that having heard this, and this is going to sound like a trick question because I'm talking about rebuttals and proving things wrong, but I promise you it's not. I genuinely believe what I just said. It's real. Who here is willing to believe that what I've said is true? So believe you, you know. Cool. Um, and who here is, believes that it's true enough that may actually repeat the story and tell their friends? You know? Not necessarily say this is definitely true, but you say, I heard this cool thing, you'd pass it on. Because I didn't tell you this to, to help you all become more confident, that that's a cool side effect. But what I wanted to do is share with as many people as possible that magical moment where you just encountered information for the first time. You had no opinion about it, you had no belief. And you've gone from having no opinion or belief to learning something and then tentatively forming a belief. Possibly permanently. Yeah. You're at that point where um, you're making your mind up as to whether you're going to believe it or not and you can be swayed by a little bit more evidence, a little bit more information or potentially have the whole belief destroyed. If I now bring a slide up which says, ah, I made it all up, you'd probably not believe it from then on. But if the next speaker comes up and reiterates it again and again, then it'll form a belief. I believe that that magical moment when your brain is encountering information and not sure, is where this fight against false information will be won or lost. Um, this moment when we f um, is where we need to fight false beliefs because changing minds is really hard. When someone's made their mind up, they don't like changing it again. How hard exactly? Well, you have to overcome confirmation bias, which is, I love, I love confirmation bias. Everyone knows the term, but I just love the fact that it's the tendency to search for, interpret, and remember information in a way which, concern, con, uh, which confirms your preconceptions. So there's like three levels that it works on. You look for it, and then when you get it, you interpret it your way, and then even if it's not again for you, you'll remember it as if it was. It's, that's so pervasive. Availability cascade, which is if you repeat something long enough, it becomes true. Um, backfire effect, when people react to disconfirming evidence by strengthening their beliefs. Um, Bias, blind spot, choice supportive bias. Um, Bayesian conservatism, belief revision in the lower right. The tendency to insufficiently revise one's beliefs when presented with new evidence. We have all of these cognitive biases which stop us from changing our beliefs. And, and plenty of studies have been done on this stuff as well. Um, this, this is a, an article which came out very recently and it just asserts in the middle of it um, that people argue against counter-attitudinal evidence while readily accepting pro-attitudinal evidence is undisputed. Um, the next paper. Uh, people who hold strong opinions on complex social issues are likely to examine relevant empirical evidence in a biased manner. They are apt to accept confirming evidence at face value while subjecting disconfirming evidence to critical evaluation and as a result, to draw undue support for their initial positions from mixed or random empirical findings. And like, this just, it makes sense, right? When someone tells you something you agree with, you're like, oh yeah, of course, oh, yeah, it's cool. 
someone tells you something you disagree with, you're like, hang on, I don't know about that. You know, this, is, this is quite obvious, but I, I like to put up academic papers just to make sure I'm right, right? Because I am. So, but it goes even deeper than that, because not only um, do we interpret things our way, but we go out of our way to avoid being exposed to information that contradicts our beliefs. What, when you believe something, you have, uh, your beliefs create preferences, and so you, you watch the news program that agrees with you. You go to the rallies which present the attitudes that suit you. Um, you use the websites which prevent, present the information that, again, um, backs up your beliefs. Because I guarantee you that creationists don't use Wikipedia. Because it says things which contradict their beliefs. Just the same as you won't use Conservapedia, I'm guessing. Because it says the Bible is a great book and, sorry, not, not the best example, but like the, uh, the entry on the Bible was quite entertaining to me, what they have on Conservapedia. Um, and yeah, has anyone ever, ever had some time to read Conservapedia? It's good fun, isn't it? So, um, when you have opinions and beliefs, you have preferences, and you, so you seek out those information sources which contradict, um, the information sources which contradict your belief tend to not be preferences. Things which tell us we are right make us feel good, things which tell us we are wrong make us feel bad. Um, and it makes sense too, because our beliefs are like a giant lattice work, and they all sort of rest up on each other. And if you start challenging some of those beliefs, especially, especially the core ones, then it can destabilize other beliefs, and it can bring our whole world crashing down. It can be very traumatic for people. So it's best not to, you know, rock the house and rock the boat. So people avoid it. Um, so, so people avoid situations which might confront their beliefs, and then if they somehow encounter them still, then they will tend to avoid engaging with them anyway. And then if they accidentally engage with them, they do all sorts of things to avoid changing their minds. So clearly we should all stop wasting our time by arguing with people that have made their minds up, right? No. Because I think, particularly in the internet, internet debates are just like public debates. You're not actually debating with the people on the other table. You're arguing against each other, but it's not for them, it's for the audience. It's for the people that are watching. Because they've made up their mind, they are true believers, they are absolutely devout. But everyone in the audience is just watching and they're not sure, they're trying to be persuaded because they're at that magical point where their minds are being made up. So, um, I think it's important also not to forget that every single year there are another 134 million minds joining us who have no beliefs at all. Um, and as each wave of those new vulnerable brains start encountering claims on the internet, do we really want them encountering misinformation without any sort of access to counter arguments, without any sort of you know, mimetic immune system? Um, and this brings us to my ultimate objective with Rebutter. It isn't about convincing true believers that they are wrong, because that's hard. Rebutter is all about using this debate process to build a system which exposes everyone to an iterative process of critical reflection. So let me put that another way. We want to build a framework around the web which will build something which constantly says someone disagrees with this perspective. Whenever you see something on the internet and then gives you the ability to see exactly why that someone disagrees. So, As you browse, you hit a website, someone disagrees with this, click through and you can read their rebuttal and it tells you exactly why they disagree. Put you in a constant state of skeptical approach to information. And I want that there for the next generation as they start encountering information for the first time. Now, can you imagine what that would be like to grow up in that world where every time you encounter new information, you said, be skeptical, question this. And if you're not sure how to be skeptical yourself, go and read what someone else has said. Maybe they've got a good example of it. I think kids learn really well through demonstration. So having that access to those rebuttals will teach them how to critically analyze an argument, how to look for evidence, how to question evidence, and, and you know, so forth. It's, it's just a demonstration example of how to be critical. Um, so we're not trying to change people, people's minds. We're trying to build a future of evidence demanding critical thinkers who will challenge authority and have a deep understanding of logical fallacies and cognitive biases. And here's the beautiful thing. 
for all the people, for all the differences we have, you know, skeptics have with um, anti-vaxxers and conspiracy theorists and 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 you know, um, psychics and whatever, we all have one belief in common, and that is we all absolutely certainly believe the evidence is on our side, <laughs> right? So. Our goal is to provide a tool which will teach kids to critically analyze claims and look for the evidence. So everyone can see the value in that proposition. Psychics, homeopaths, because we all believe that this means the next generation will finally break free from the brainwashing put onto them by whoever. So this is, you know, this is the message it conveys. So there's no reason why everyone of every belief system can install Rebutter and use it to promote their own position and to push it because it's fighting for critical thinking and evidence demanding future. It's not about saying that we're right. We will fight for our side. We will push that you know, vaccines are good and ghosts don't exist and whatever. And absolutely we should. And absolutely they should push their side because it's a debate. It is a global debate where everyone has their say and the people watching are merely being exposed to that process of question this. Don't take anything from authority. And I think everyone in this room should agree that our side definitely wants that. We don't want anyone to believe things on authority. We want them to use rational thinking, critical analysis, and to break information down and look for the evidence. So we're trying to build that, and I think that everyone, everyone in society agrees with that concept because, again, everyone thinks they're right, so everyone's on board. So I, I hope that now you can see that Rebutter is not a tool for skeptics. Rebutter is a tool for making skeptics. And that's. <laughs> yeah. So that's our vision. <laughs> I'm going to now get back to the topic of the workshop, which is crowdsourcing skepticism. Um, because crowdsourcing requires volunteer participation. We need your support if we're ever going to stand a chance of building this internet which, makes you know, which creates critical thinkers. So there are three primary things which we need more than anything else. So the first one, obviously, installing our plugins, just a necessary step. Um, you can't actually add rebuttals without the plugin at this stage, though we hope to rectify this because at the moment we're only available in Chrome and we're not about to start working on the other plugins. For the last year we've been saying we're going to expand to Firefox, but a year ago um, Firefox and Chrome were about the same level. But as you can see, all the other browsers are going down and Chrome's getting more and more users. So at this point, we have limited resources. Um, there's only one programmer working with us, um, co-founder. And um, we need to pick and choose where we're going to invest our time. So only in Chrome at the moment, but as I said, we're hoping to build a frame which will be browser independent. So you need to install the plugin, um, which brings me to the second um, bit of help that we need, which is submitting rebuttals. This is the primary part of our crowdsourcing efforts. We need people that are browsing the internet to recognize when they are reading a rebuttal. Because as, as I said, the whole idea of this came from me finding an article and wanting a rebuttal, and I couldn't find them. They're hard to find when you're starting at the source page, the page making the claim. But if you guys, you will read more rebuttals than anyone else, because most skeptic blogs are debunking something, right? So whenever you read an article which says such and such said something and they are wrong because, you're reading a rebuttal. Submit it. It takes like 20 seconds. You just need to hit, this is a rebuttal. This, I'm going to show you how to do it um, in a few moments. But we need people adding rebuttals. Um, now, actually, at the beginning of this, I talked about, well, I want to make the point that one of the great things about crowdsourcing is that you can have huge impacts with very small actions. And I believe this is definitely the case with Rebutter, that that 20 seconds of submitting a rebuttal can have incredible impacts. For a start, you can have a huge impact by changing one or two people's lives. If you've submitted a rebuttal to a scam, which is trying to scam people out of their money, and there's God knows how many thousands of them on the internet, you could save someone their life savings because they could hit that scam page and get the rebuttal and you know, they may have acted on it but the rebuttal saves them. That could happen. But I think um, you can also have huge impacts by having lots and lots of little impacts or lo um, little impacts over a long period of time. Rebutter provides all of these. So um, for example, 
Does anyone remember Coney 2012? Yeah. Um, as that was happening, we were adding rebuttals to that, quite an extensive network of rebuttals. We've got 12 rebuttals to that page, for example, and they carried on because the Coney 2012 um, team responded to them and critics responded to them and whatnot. So we um, mapped that discussion really well. Of course, we were really new at the time, we don't have many users, but imagine an internet where everyone has rebutter installed or has access to this information. Then when you've got 97 million people watching this video, then having access to those counterpoints could provide 97 million people with a much broader perspective on this topic. You know, I'm not necessarily saying this, these guys were great or not great, but having that wider perspective has an impact. And if you have that small impact across 100 million people, that's a huge impact. Um, but also, these connections are permanent. That video is stuck on the web now virtually forever, and the rebuttals to it, they're also there forever, and that connection is therefore permanent. So by mapping it, doing that little bit of action, you've added something permanently to the web. And you know, we're all warned, don't put your personal information on the internet because you can't get rid of it. It's the same with this, you can't get rid of them. But um, articles like this, this was published four years ago, and it has just resurfaced as if it was new on this website. So this sort of thing happens all the time where stories just get regurgitated. It's really weird, but it keeps happening. So maybe if, you know, in the internet where rebuttal is ubiquitous, the rebuttals will either stop it from being regurgitated because it's been answered, or make the regurgitation, maybe they'll refine it and make it a little bit better than the original. They'll fix up some errors in it. Or if that doesn't happen, if they just regurgitate it still, then to find rebuttals to the new version, you can just go to the old version and copy them across. You know, so um, the fact that these connections will last forever will help as we continue to move forward, the more content is made and, and yeah, th they will always be there. So, um, the final action point was telling people about Rebutter. So, um, we're all about word of mouth. Uh, so, sharing, telling people about Rebutter is incredibly helpful to us. Particularly if you're telling journalists or people with large followings, that's cool too. But um, any sort of word of mouth sharing. Um, and anyone who does all three of these, so if you install and add Rebuttals and tell people about us, then Carl Sagan says, I was just looking for an excuse to put that in, to be honest. Um, because ultimately, our success in this project is completely up to you guys. We need you and we love you. No end. We, Rebutter is nothing without a, um, a, lo a loyal, large following. And so we're in the process of trying to build that because this vision of an internet which just lets people pick and choose their beliefs is terrifying to me. And I think we need to do something to stop that. So. Um, I, I've got like two minutes left, okay then. Um, so I just want to give a couple of examples of how Rebutter is being used currently. Bob, who is next door giving the um, presentation over there, is one of our best users. He found a um, rebuttal by um, David Gorski, science-based medicine, he's walking the, the things, of the Berzinski Clinic. And he systematically added that to over 117 different pages on the web which talk about the Berzinski Clinic and how great it is. So that's one example of how everybody can be used to just, now whenever anyone hits one of those many, many pages, it'll redirect to that one page. Um, of course, all the Bozinski Clinic need to do now is rebut that one page and show that it's wrong and it's completely undone it all. But no one's stepped up yet and there's no rebuttals to it. Um, but they'd need to have a really good argument. Um, another, we need more people like um, Pepin is from Denmark. He's, he um, saw these articles saying that students had shown that Wi-Fi kills plants. So he wrote his own rebuttal to it, submitted it to all the articles he could find making the claim, and then used our Twitter widget to reply to people that were sharing it. And he ended up driving over 50,000 visitors to his article. Now I want to say we really support people doing that. If you write rebuttals, drive as much traffic to, to your article as you want, because that's what we want. We want people reading rebuttals. So we're trying our best to, you know, like this Twitter wid widget was a um, small breakthrough for us for helping get traffic to the people that write the rebuttals. Um, then uh, Mary M is um, passionate about GMO, genetically modified organism debate, 
and she knows a lot about it, so she's always adding rebuttals on that subject. And I expect this to be the norm, because most people are ignorant about most things, and you have one or two areas you know a lot about. So I expect most people to do this sort of thing. And she's been constantly adding rebuttals over the last year, um, and we love her for it. And then we have someone like out on a boat here, um, submitted her first rebuttal, and sent out two tweets. Um, one of them has 112,000 followers, and within a minute, that person retweeted it to her 112,000 followers. So this is someone that sent out something about um, the Amish not getting autism. Yeah, look, they don't use technology, they don't get autism. And of course, it's complete nonsense. So they've shared misinformation, but then in, you know, soon after then reshared, oh, actually, maybe that's not true. So how's that for an impact in the fight against misinformation? Um, So this slide was just here to remind me to actually get my video ready, but I think I'm out of time. So I, what I might do is I've got a little video demonstrating how to register, install, and submit rebuttals. Um, we'll see how we go for time at the end and with questions, and I can stick it on at the end. Um, but basically, of course, rebuttal is completely free. I just like the image. Um, and we're not going to be charging for any time soon. The whole project is self-funded by my partner and I. We have other income sources. And basically, we just keep our costs as low as possible. Um, that said, if anyone knows of any, I know there's often charities, funds, and competitions. If anyone knows of any of those that happen to work with what we're doing, then please send us an email because, you know, happy to apply for them because a bit of funding can help with our server costs and travels to things like this. So, um, yeah, we're not looking for investors or anything like that either because we, we don't want to have any financial burdens on our business. It's not trying to make money. Um, so that's that. Yep, I'm up to 42 minutes. So um, thank you all for listening to my part of this workshop. Um, that's the video again. Tim is going to take over now and um, give us a quick overview of other apps out. Um, Tim is the... Uh, owner of um, a blog called Skeptools. Many of you probably know Tim. He's very active, does a lot of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, Tim knows all about all the tools out there which are trying to achieve all this stuff. And a lot of, a lot of them are crowdsourcing. I think he's going to cover a few that aren't. OK. Um, so <coughs> it's Tim. <laughs> Hi. I'm just going to talk real quick about up and coming new tools. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in uh, people building new tools like Rebutter um, that are of interest to skeptics. Sometimes it's not entirely obvious. Sometimes they're not really targeted at skeptics, like Rebutter originally wasn't. Um, and I'll clue you into a few that already exist and clue you into where you can spot these things when they come up. The first one I'm going to talk about is one that launched in February called Reality Drop, and this is from the uh, a nonprofit called the Climate Reality Group um, that Al Gore is involved in, and it's about climate misinformation online, and it targets that misinformation, um, and the idea is that it, to rally folks like us that are interested in the science of climate change to talk about climate change, share good information and to comment on bad articles. Uh, because if you go to climate change articles, particularly on general purpose news websites, you'll see there's an endless series of comments at the bottom uh, by people who reject uh, the science of climate change or whatever. And they want to get another voice in there. So they'll point out articles to, for you to comment on. or things that are trending topics things that are being passed around on Twitter and things like that. And the interesting thing about this site is that it uses something called gamification, which is they built the site as if it, you were playing a video game almost, uh, in that it scores what you're doing and it grades you against other people. And the idea is to give you an incentive to do the thing. And again, the, it's a crowdsourcing thing, so the things you do are very simple, like send a tweet about this article or go comment on this article. But 
the net effect can be large. So they'll measure that effect and they'll measure the net amount of stuff you've done on the system and give you an idea of how you're doing relative to the other volunteers. And it just kind of makes it a little bit of fun. It's very silly, but you'd be amazed at how that acts as an incentive for people. And it's at realitydrop.org. I will post something later today on my blog that has all the links that are in this presentation. This is what the main screen on Reality Drop looks like, and they always have a couple of articles near the top. Anything with a lot of green on it is an article that has good uh, reality-based climate science in it. Stuff with a lot of red perhaps has conspiracy theories, myths, incorrect information. And you can click the button to do various things relating to that article. Maybe tweet a good article, maybe go comment on a bad one, and they have a little crawl at the top. Now they also link all these articles with a database of what the basic facts are about climate change and they licensed all that information. You see the link in the middle that says uh, myth versus reality. They have a whole database in there of kind of the basics, you know, what is the hockey stick, uh, you know, how much Arctic ice are we losing, those types of things. And uh, they link it in there so you can learn about climate change at the same time. And those pages serve as a place that you can link people to when they ask questions. It's all the same data. They actually license the data from the Skeptical Science uh, website, which is a great resource for climate change. And this is the scorecard for one of the users on the site. And you can see that you get an overall score, and it lists how many different myths you've crushed. They try to make it, uh, you use some fun uh, terminology and which ones, they give you a chart of which ones you do the most, and you can earn these little badges when you accomplish certain things. Now that one was obviously built and targeted at us, right, at skeptics who are interested in the climate issue. Um, a lot of the other tools that I've been seeing in the last year and a half or so aren't necessarily targeted at us, uh, but where they're coming from is out of journalism. Uh, you know, if you've got a pulse and are paying attention, you know there's a lot of newspapers and magazines that are going out of business. Journalism's kind of been in crisis for a couple of years because people don't read paper uh, newspapers anymore and where's the revenue? All the, uh, all the classified ads went online and that's where a lot of their revenue was. So they've been looking for new ways to do things. How can we reform ourselves in an internet era so that uh, we can make money, we can uh, fit in? And one of the ways they're doing this is through a number of nonprofits that are funding different research teams. Sometimes people like Shane, sometimes more academic researchers, but just trying different things and building things. And some of them are very journalistic oriented that maybe wouldn't interest a skeptic, like building tools that journalists would use in the newsroom. But occasionally some of them are very interesting to skeptics because there's a lot of interest in the fact checking space. You know, because everything's moved to the blogs and you have a lot of very biased sources on the net, the idea of can we do automated fact checking, can we provide things like rebutter, can we provide automated ways for people to figure out what's true and what's not, uh, there's a lot of people interested in that space. And there's a couple of experiments that aren't really crowdsourcing projects. Uh, one's called Truth Teller that does live uh, debunks of speeches that are being broadcast and literally uh, uh, shows the fact checks live and there's another one called truth goggles and those were prototypes that were built. They aren't um, really a product you can use. But here's one that you can use. It's called Pundit Tracker and the target is to track, you know, you've got all these talking heads on the, on the news and they're constantly making predictions the economy's going to collapse, Obama's not going to be reelected, whatever. <laughs> And there's no, um, there's no penalty for being wrong. And these guys are amazingly wrong. So someone decided to build a site to show how amazingly wrong they are. And they launched it. Actually, they've had the site for a long time, but the actual game, or what you want to call it, was launched in September. Uh, they track, currently, they track finance, politics, and sports. I've been bugging them, saying, hey, you know, psychics would kind of fit in here. Um, <laughs> I don't know if they want to do that, but maybe we can convince them at some point. But there's a crowdsourcing aspect because site, uh, the users of the site vote on how bold the predictions are. Obviously, if I predict the sun's going to come up tomorrow, that's not a very useful prediction and it's going to be right. But if I predict the world's going to end tomorrow, that's a quite a different thing. So they try to score those differently based on what the site users say 
about the predictions. And then they rate the pundits for accuracy. So you get a display like this, and you can see that various people are given F ratings and C plus. And right in here are down on the lower left are the topics that have, predictions have been made recently that they're asking you to, to vote on. So that's an, that's an example of kind of the sort of in the journalism space type of thing that's going on. Now here's something that could be used more directly by skeptics. It's the US version of a site called journalism, or Journalism, which has existed in the UK for quite some time. The US version launched in April um, by a nonprofit called the Sunlight Foundation. And what it does is it automatically matches news articles against press releases, published speeches, uh, Wikipedia articles, so basically you can see how much of the news article you're reading was plagiarized or taken from various sources. And the idea and the, and the reason that the, the, the definition of the term journalism is cut and paste journalism. Journalists who get press releases from people and uh, just cut and paste things from the press release and don't do their homework. And we're trying to catch people when they're doing that. And, uh, Sometimes you can find out very interesting things. Now this site also has a Chrome browser plugin, so it can automatically notify you that when you're looking at a site that they have information about the detail of that article. And uh, there's the link for it. It's journalism.sunlightfoundation. Now when you go to their site, you can just paste the text of the article in if you want, like if someone emailed you something, or you can give it the URL. And what it will do is generate this side-by-side -side view. On the left side here is some pasted text of a New York Daily News article. And I'm sure you can't read it, but it's an article about um, how millions of Americans believe that uh, aliens are already here. And it's like, oh, really? I wonder where that figure came from. Well, it turns out that the text of this article matches in a substantive way a press release that came from a UFO group. Um, <laughs> And so there's the match right there. And this is on PR web. There's various places that press releases get uh, um, posted so they can match that up directly. And when you scroll down, you can see it'll actually highlight the text and draw a line and show you exactly where the text goes. And what's neat about that is that if this is a quote, it, you can see quotes that are taken out of context. Uh, you can also see when journalists plagiarize Wikipedia articles and just cut and paste stuff from there. So it's a very interesting tool to catch bad journalism and potentially sometimes catch, uh, you know, how science articles will often talk about a study and they won't tell you where the study is. Well, if there was a press release from the university about the study, you'll often find it there. And the university will always tell you where the study is because they want you to know about their work. Kind of related to that is another UK um, uh, tool called unsource.org. This launched about a year ago. And this attacks that basic problem of science articles and other articles that don't really tell you where their sources came from. Where did this statistic come from? Where was this paper actually written? And it links the articles to, to them. Now, journalism is more of an automated tool, although you can help by actually pasting stuff in and it will show up in their sort of archives. This tool is actually crowdsourced. So they depend on people actually going out, finding the sources, and linking them up. But they also have a browser plugin, so you can put it in your Chrome browser, and when you're browsing the web, it'll tell you when you're looking at a site that, or looking at an article that's unsourced, uh, and will also link to their version of journalism and tell you whether or not that's a, an article that was just cut and pasted. It's from the Media Standards Trust, which is a uh, nonprofit in the UK. Here's an example of a screen you get when you have the unsourced. Um, uh, this is a really crappy article about some survey about doing your partner's chores. And these little yellow stickers pop up over top and says, oh, by the way, this article is basically a press release, cut and pasted. And this press release came from a dodgy survey that was done for uh, the company involved. Um, there are a number, like I said, of fact-checking apps that people in the journalism space are working on. They're not all completely fully baked. A lot of them are kind of interesting ideas, but not quite there yet. Two of them that are up and running and you can actually go log in on are FactLink and Skeptiv. And these are crowdsourced sites, so you can go in there and actually, and they do basically sentence level, I agree with this, I disagree with this, this is true, this is not true, um, on the web. 
Um, it's not entirely clear to me. I mean, you can kind of see the value in rebutter. I'm not quite sure I see where they're going with it, but it's an interesting effort. And there's a couple of others that I've heard about, but, and I've actually talked to the guy who's working on debunker, but they don't really have anything to show you. It's called How True and Debunker. Um, and I mentioned Truth Goggles easy, uh, earlier that draws from the political fact-checking sites. Um, now, a very interesting one that I want you all to pay attention to because they're just going into alpha now, and this could be a very interesting tool for skeptics going, for, for, boom, going forward, and it's called Hypothesis, and it has that weirdly spelled domain name. And it is a nonprofit, and it was launched via Kickstarter in 2011, and they are building essentially an annotation layer for the entire web. If you remember from the early days of the web, there were a couple of startups that would let you put sticky notes on web pages that other people could see, essentially, like those ones you just saw. They're kind of redoing that on the argument that that was part of the idea of the web to begin with, but they're doing it very slowly and very carefully. Uh, they're designing it as open source so that it potentially it'll plug into any browser um, and people will be able to comment on how it works. And they're building a very careful reputation layer into it. They actually had an entire conference just about how to design their reputation layer. So for instance, if I'm not an expert in how cameras work, something that I comment on a camera site would not mean as much as, say, someone who had designed cameras for a li um, living. And it remains to be seen, like I said, it's only in alpha. You can go to hypothesis slash alpha and you can actually load it into your browser and try it out. Um, but we should be watching this. And the reason we should be watching this, and, and Shane touched on this in his presentation too, is critical mass is crucial for these projects. We have to have people helping out um, or they won't go anywhere. You can't crowdsource without a crowd. And so if skeptics aren't ready to jump in, and be the crowd for these fact-checking sites, um, they can easily die. Um, we need to be ready to volunteer. We need to promote it to other skeptics. We need to talk about what we're doing. Um, and to give you an example, there was a really, I thought, kind of neat thing that launched last September after we did the workshop last year. Um, and it's already been shut down. It was called Truth Market, and it was sort of a cross between, if you know, Kickstarter is a way to fund new projects. And of course, you know the Million Dollar Challenge, JREF's Million Dollar Challenge. Truth Market was sort of a cross between the two. You could set up a campaign to get people to donate money to challenge people who were making claims. And it wasn't necessarily for, um, uh, it wasn't for paranormal things, but it was for science-based claims, political claims, any sort of public claim that, you know, someone claims that this can cure cancer. All right, I'll put up $5,000 if you can prove whether it's right. And they had set up a uh, organization where they were going to have basically a jury of experts judge what was right, and if you challenged someone and they were proven wrong, you would get the money. So basically, you could earn money by issuing challenges, and other people could put money in the fund, and you would get paid if the jury decided you were correct and that person was wrong, and it would become part of the public record. But there wasn't a lot of interest in it. People didn't step up. They didn't make challenges on the site. They didn't put their money in. And it just didn't go anywhere. And they decided it wasn't uh, working and shut it down in April. So that's an example of where if we're not paying attention and we don't notice that these things are getting launched, um, they'll go away. So uh, I talk about this stuff all the time on my blog, skeptools.com. I also am on the Skepticality podcast on virtual skeptics. And I talk about these types of things all the time. So seek me out and you'll learn about these things as they come up.